Bear with me a moment now, chicken section. Since hens have a far greater commercial value than males, cocks, roosters, it's apparently vital to determine the sex of a newly hatched chick in order to know whether to expand capital or raising it or not. You see, a cock is nearly worthless, apparently, on the open market. The sex characteristics of newly hatched chicks, however, are normally internal. And it is impossible with the naked eye to tell whether a given chick is a hen or a cock. This is what I have been told, at any rate. A professional chicken sexer, however, can nevertheless tell the sex. He can go through a brood of freshly hatched chicks, examining each one entirely by eye, and tell the poultry farmer which chicks to keep and which are cocks. The cocks are to be allowed to perish. Hen, hen, cock, cock, hen, and so on and so forth. This is apparently in Australia, the profession, and they are nearly always right, correct. The fowl, determined to be hens, do in fact grow up to be hens and return the poultry farmer's investment. What the chicken sexer can do, however, is explain how he knows. The sex, it's apparently often a patrilineal profession handed down from father to son. Australia, New Zealand, have him hold up a new hatched chick, a young cock, shall we say, and ask him how he can tell that it is a cock. And that professional chicken sexer will apparently shrug his shoulders and say, Looks like a cock to me, doubtless adding mate, much the way you or I would say my friend or sir. This is the aptest analogy I can adduce to explain it. Some mysterious sixth sense, perhaps. Not that I am right 100% of the time, but you would be surprised. We would be on the ottoman having a drink, enjoying some music, light conversation. This is now on the third day together, late in the evening after dinner, and perhaps a film or a bit of dancing. I do very much like the dance. We are not seated close together on the ottoman. Usually I'm at once in, and she at the other, though it is only a four and a half foot ottoman. It's not a terribly long piece of furniture, however. However, the point is that we are not in a posture of particular intimacy, very casual and so on. A great deal of complex body language is involved and has taken place all over the prior time spent in one another's company, which I will not bore you with by attempting to go into. So then, when I sense the moment is right on the ottoman, comfortable with drinks, perhaps some Ligeti on the audio system, I will say without any discernible context or lead-in that you could point to as such, how would you feel about me tying you up, those nine oh, words, no. just so, some rebuff me on the spot, but it's a small percentage, very small, perhaps shockingly small. I will know whether it's going to happen the moment I ask. I can nearly always tell. Again, I cannot fully explain how. There will always be a moment of complete silence. Heavy, you are, of course, aware that social silences have varied textures, and these textures communicate a great deal. This silence will occur whether I'm to be rebuffed or not, whether I have been incorrect about the flexion of upraised fingers to signal find tone quotes hen or not her silence and the weight of it a perfectly natural reaction to such a shift in the texture of a hitherto casual conversation and it brings to a sudden head all the romantic tensions and cues and body language of the first three dates initial or early stage dates are fantastically rich from a psychological standpoint doubtless you are aware of this any sort of courtship ritual game of sizing one another up gauging there is afterward always that eight beat silence they must allow the question to sink in. This was an expression of my mother's, by the way, to let such and such sinks in. And as it happens, it is nearly perfect as a descriptor of what occurs. Alive and kicking. She lives with my sister and her husband and their two small children, very much alive. Nor do rest assured that I do not delude myself that low percentage of rebuffs is due to any overwhelming allure on my part. This is not how an activity like this works. In fact, it is one reason why I propose a possibility in such a bold and apparently graceless way. I withhold any attempt at charm or assuasion because I know full well that their response to the proposal depends on factors internal to them. Some will wish to play, a few will not. That is all there is to it. The only real talent I profess is the ability to gauge them, screen them, so that by the such that a preponderance of the third dates are, if you will, hens rather than cocks. I use this avian tropes as metaphors, not in any way to characterize the subject, but rather to emphasize my own unanalyzable ability to know, intuitively, as early as the first date, whether they are, if you will, right 
for the proposal to tie them up. And that is just how I put it. I do not dress it up or attempt to make it seem any more romantic or exotic than that, nor as to the rebuffs. The rebuffs are very rarely hostile, very rarely, and then only if the subject in question really in fact does wish to play, but is conflicted or emotionally inequipped to accept this wish and so must use hostility to the proposal as a means of assuring herself that no such wish or affinity exists. This is sometimes known as aversion coding. It's very easy to discern and to and as such, it is nearly impossible to take the hostility personally. The rare subjects about whom I've simply been incorrect, on the other hand, are often amused, or sometimes curious and thus interrogative, but in all events, in the end, they simply decline the proposal in clear and forthright terms. These are the cocks I have mistaken for hens. It happens, as of my last reckoning, I have been rebuffed just over 15% of the time. On the third day, this figure is actually a bit high because it includes a hostile, hysterical, or affronted rebuffs, which do not result, at least in my opinion, which do not result from my misjudging a cock. Again, please note that I do not possess or pretend to possess specialized knowledge about poultry or professional brood management. I use the metaphors only to convey the apparent ineffability of my intuition about prospective players and the game I propose. No, please also know, do I uh, so much as touch them or any way flirt with them before the third day? Nor on that third day do I launch myself at them or move toward them in any way as I hit them with the proposal. I propose it bluntly, but unthreateningly from my end, out of four and a half foot on them. I do not force myself on them in any way. I am not a Lothario. I know what the contract is about, and it is not about seduction, conquest, intercourse, or algolagnia. What is it about is my desire symbolically to work out certain internal complexes consequent to my rather irregular childhood relations with my mother and twin sister is not s &M, and I am not a sadist, and I am not interested in subjects who wish to be hurt. My sister and I are fraternal twins, by the way, and in adulthood look scarcely anything alike. What am I about? When I suddenly inquire, apropos of nothing, whether I might take them into the other room and tie them up is describable, at least in part, in the phrase of Marchesani and in Svenskaj's theory of masochistic symbolism as proposing a contractual scenario. The crucial factor here is that I am every bit as interested in the contract as in this scenario. Hence, the blunt formality, the mix of aggression and decorum in my proposal. They took her in after she suffered a series of small but not life-threatening strokes, cerebral events, and simply could no longer get around well enough to live on her own. She refused even to consider institutional care. This was not even a possibility so far as she was concerned. My sister, of course, came immediately to the rescue. Mummy was her own room, of course. While my sister's two children must now share one, the room is on the first floor to prevent her having to negotiate the staircase which is steep and uncarpeted. I have to tell you, I know precisely what the whole thing is about. It is easy to know. There on the ottoman. That it is going to happen. That I have gave the thing correctly. The Getty, whose work you are doubtless aware is as dragnated to the point of a tonality, provides ideal atmosphere in which to propose the contractual scenario. Over 85% of the time, the subject accepts. There is no predatory thrill at the subject's acquiescence. Because it is not a matter of acquiescence at all. Not at all. I will ask how they feel about the idea of my tying them up. There will be a dense and heavily charged silence, a gathering voltage in the air above the ottoman. In that voltage, the question dwells until it has come on the song in. They will, in most cases, abruptly change the posture on the ottoman so as suddenly to straighten their posture, sit up straight, and so on. This is an unconscious gesture designed to communicate strength and autonomy, to assert that they alone have the power to decide how to respond on the proposal. It stems from an insecure fear that something ostensibly weak or pliable in their character might have led me to view them as candidates for 
domination or bondage. People's psychological dynamics are fascinating. That a subject's first unconscious concern is what it might be about her that might prompt such a proposal might lead a man to think such a thing might be possible. Selectively concern, in other words, about their self presentation. You would almost have to be there in the room with us to appreciate the very, very complex and fascinating dynamics that accompany this charged silence and point to fact in its naked assertion of personal power. The sudden improvement in posture, in fact, communicates a clear desire to submit, to accept, to play. In other words, any assertion of power signifies in this charged context a hen. In the heavily stylized formalism of masochistic play, you see, the ritual is contracted and organized in such a way that the apparent inequality in power is, in fact, fully empowered and autonomous. Thank you. This shows me you really are attending, that you are an acute and observative auditor. Now, where have I put it very gracefully? What would render you and I, for example, go into my apartment and entering into some contractual activity that included my time? You what to play is that it would be entirely different from my somehow learning you to my home and once there launching myself at you and overpowering you and tying you up there would be no play in that the play is in your freely and autonomously submitting to be tied up the purpose of the contractual nature of masochistic or bonded play i propose she accepts i propose something further she accepts it is to formalize the power structure, ritualize it. The play is the submission, the bondage, the giving up of power to another. But the contract, the rules, as it were, of the game, the contract, ensure that all abdications of power are freely chosen. In other words, an assertion that one is secure enough in one's concept to one's own personal power to ritualize we give up the power to another person in this example me who will then proceed to take off your slacks and sweater and under things and tie your wrists and ankles to my antique bed post with satin thongs I am of course for the purposes of this conversation merely using you as an example do not think that I am actually proposing any contractual possible Possibility with you, I scarcely know you. Not to mention the amount of context and explanation I am granting you here. This is not how I operate. Ha ha ha! No, oh, my dear, you have nothing to fear from me. But of course, you are. My own mother was, by all accounts, a magnificent individual, but of somewhat, shall we say, uneven temperament, erratic and uneven in her domestic and the day to day affairs, erratic in her dealings with of her two queen children, more specifically me. This has between me certain psychological complexes having to do with power and perhaps trust the regularity of the acquiescence is nearly astounding. As the shoulders come up and her overall posture becomes more erect, the head is thrown back as well, such that she is now sitting up very straight and appears almost to be withdrawn from the conversational space. Still on the ottoman, but withdrawn as far as she possibly can within the strictures of that space. It's apparent withdrawal. While intended to communicate shock and surprise, and thus that she is most decidedly not the sort of person to whom the possibility ever of being invited to permit someone to tie her up would ever even occur, actually signifies a profound ambivalence of conflict. By which I mean that a possibility which had hitherto existed only internally, potentially, abstractly, is a part of the subject's unconscious fantasy, their best wishes, has now suddenly been externalized and given. Conscious way, maybe as an actual possibility. It's a fascinating irony that body language intended to convey shock. Does indeed convey shock. 
but a very Cross different it. sort of shock indeed. Namely, the abiatic shock of the past, which is bursting restrictions and penetrating consciousness, but from an external source, from the concrete other, who is also male and a partner oh, in the Maytan ritual, and thus always right for transference the phrase. Thinking is thus far more pro free than you might originally have imagined. Such penetration, of course, requires time only when there is resistance. Or, for example, that is, you know, the whole cliche. I can't believe my ears consider its import. My own experience indicates that the cliche does not mean. I can't believe that this possibility now exists in my consciousness, but rather something more along the lines of... I cannot believe that this possibility is now originating from a blind external to my consciousness! It is the same sort of shock. A several second delay in internalizing or processing which accompanies sudden bad news or some inexplicable betrayal by a hitherto trusted authority figure, and so on and so forth. This interval of shocked silence is one during which entire psychological maps are being redrawn, and during this interval any gesture or affect on the subject part will reveal a great deal more about her than any amount of banal conversation or even clinical experimentation would reveal. Cross it. I meant woman, or young woman, not subject, per se. The true cocks of real ones, the rare ones I have misjudged, will yield the breathers of these shocked pauses. They will smile politely or even laugh, and then will decline the proposal in very direct and forthright terms. No harm, no foul. <laughs> no pun intended. Cock, foul. These subjects, internal psychological maps, have ample room for the possibility of being tied up. And they freely consider and freely reject it. They are simply not interested. I have no problem with this, with discovering I'm mistaking a cock for a hen. Again, I'm not interested in forcing or controlling or persuading anyone against her will. I'm certainly not going to beg her. That is not what this is about. I know what this is about. The and force is not what this is about. The others, the long, weighted, high, voltage, pause, the postural and effective shock, whether they acquiesce or become offended, outraged, these are the true hands, players. These are the ones who I have not at all misjudged as their heads are thrown back, but their eyes are on me, fixed, looking at me, gazing, and so on. With all the intensity one associates with someone trying to decide whether or not they can trust you, with trust, now connoting a great many different possible things, whether you are having them on, whether you are serious, but are pretending to have them on in order to forestall embarrassments, should they be outraged or disgusted, or whether you are in earnest but mean the proposal abstractly, as a hypothetical question such as, what would you do with a million dollars, meant to elicit information about the personality and impossible deliberation as to a fourth date, and so on and so forth, or rather, whether it is in fact a serious proposal, even as they are looking at you because they are trying to read you, to size you up, as you have apparently sized them up, as a proposal appears to imply, this is why I always propose it in a blunt, undisguised way, abjuring money or exploiting people, or preparation, or coloratura in the pronunciation of the contractual possibility, I want to communicate to them as best I can that the proposal is serious and concrete, that I am opening my own consciousness up okay. to them and to the what possibility of rejection or even disgust. This is why I answer the their intense so gaze clear. with a bland gaze of my own, say nothing shit. to embellish or complicate or color or interrupt like the countries. processing of their okay. own Relax. internal psychic reaction. I force them to acknowledge to process. themselves that both I and process. the process. proposal process. are in deadly earnest. 
but again, please know, I am in no way aggressive or threatening about it. This is what I meant by lame gaze. I do not propose it in a creepy or lascivious way, and I do not appear in any way eager, hesitant, or conflicted. Fuck more aggressive or threatening. Fuck this is crucial. Fuck your feelings. You're doubtless Fuck aware from your own experience that one's natural and conscious Fuck reaction when someone's body language suggested to crawl or lean away from him is automatically lean forward or in. As a way to compensate and preserve Fuck the original spatial relation, I consciously avoid this reflex. This is extremely important. One does not nervously shift or lean or lift one's lift or straighten one's tie while a proposal like this is sinking in. I once, on a third date, found myself with one of those annoying, isolated, jumping muscles of twitches in my scalp, which seized on and off throughout the evening, and on the evening made it appear that I was raising and lowering one eyebrow in a rapid and lascivious way, which in physically charged after the math of the sudden proposal, simply torpedoed the whole thing, and this subject was by no stretch of the imagination thought. This was a hint, or I've never inspected a hint, yet one involuntary twitch of one eyebrow decapitated the whole possibility such that the subject not only left in such a frenzy of conflicted disgust that she forgot a purse and not only never returned to the purse, but refused even to return telephone messages in which I phoned several times and offered simply to return the purse to her at some neutral public location. The disappointment, nevertheless, drove home a valuable lesson as to just how delicate a period of internal processing and cartography this post-proposal moment could be. My mother's problem was that, toward me, her eldest child, the elder of the twins, significantly, her nurturing instincts ran to rather erratic extremes of, as it were, hot and cold. She could at one moment be very, very, very warm and maternal, and then in the flash of an instant would become angry with me over some real or imagined trifle and would completely withdraw her affection. She became cold and rejecting, rebuffing any attempts as a small child on my part to receive reassurance and affection, sometimes sending me alone to my bedroom and refusing to let me out for some rigidly specified period while my twin sister continued to enjoy unconfined freedom of movement about the house and also continued to receive warmth and maternal affection. Then, after the rigid fuck, period fuck, of confinement fuck, was Bill, over, Elon, I mean, to fuck, say the fuck, precise fuck, instant Bill, my time out was completed, Mommy would open Bill, the door Bill, and embrace my warmly and blot my tears away with his sleeve and would claim that all is forgiven and all is welcome. This flood of reassurance and nurture would once again seduce me into trusting her and revealing her and seeding emotional power in me, rendering me vulnerable to devastation all over again. Whenever she might choose again to turn cold and look at me as if I was some sort of laboratory specimen she never inspected before. This cycle played itself out repeatedly throughout our childhood life. Thank you.